can speak to Javed Ali, who is an Associate Professor of Practice at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Javed, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for your time. I'm not sure Thank if we've Adam. progressed at all, Javed, in terms of possible peace talks. The latest from Ukraine is that it's ready uh, for peace talks, but only once Russians leave all territory that they've occupied. Vladimir Putin has been saying for a few months, I believe, that he's ready to negotiate. But as long as Ukraine understands what he calls the new realities, because, of course, he's annexed at least four territories in the past few months. So we're not really moving at all, are we? I, I don't think there's any credible effort to engage in peace talks just based on the nature of the ferocious fighting in the east as your previous clip showed and it seems like each side is looking to break through against the other and these different pockets but the reality is and the, and the images that you've showed is that there is tremendous suffering on the ground russian troops are getting killed by the dozens if not hundreds on a daily basis probably the same losses are being absorbed on the ukrainian side and and ukrainian civilians are, are stuck in the middle and infrastructure is being destroyed as well so the fighting continues to be very intense the suffering continues to be very intense but i don't think there's any credible prospects of a peace deal anytime soon in terms of the breakthrough that you're talking about, what do you think Vladimir Putin's future plans are? Maybe order another mobilization? Is that maybe his best hope to sacrifice more of his soldiers in the traditional Russian way of waging war? Well, that definitely seems to be the case right now. If the even conservative estimates from, from Western uh, military assessments are true, that Russia's probably suffered about 100,000 casualties, dead and wounded, um, troops no longer able to, to be combat effective. And that's within almost a year of fighting. And how many more men is President Putin willing to sacrifice in order to achieve some concrete gains from this horrific, horrific campaign? Is it another 100,000? Is it another, another 200,000? Nobody knows the answer to that other than President Putin. But it doesn't seem like that effort just to throw soldiers into the meat grinder of eastern Ukraine is slowing down anytime soon. Yeah, that phrase, meat grinder, really says it all. And one of the commanders in uh, the east of Ukraine, a Ukrainian, has said he hasn't seen anything like it when it comes to the Wagner troops, that while their colleagues are being killed right in front of them, they continue to advance. Let's look at the civilian side of things, if you don't mind, Javed. Which civilian population do you think may crack first? Because at the end of the day, it's they, as you say, who are also suffering. You've got all the mothers of those fallen Russian soldiers who are beginning to express some sort of concerns about the special military operation, as the Kremlin calls it. And of course, you've got the Ukrainian civilians who live, whose lives have been turned upside down. Might one of those populations crack first and say to their government, you need to end this? Well, the Ukrainian um, civilian population, even though, as you mentioned, is, is suffering under the weight of this Russian campaign, um, that right now, at least at the political level, it seems there is broad support for for the war effort. Now, again, a lot could change in that, but at least right for almost a year, President Zelensky has managed to hold the country together, and that's because of the Western support and the effectiveness the Ukrainian forces have showed on the battlefield. On the flip side, I think the more these Russian troop losses continue with these staggering numbers, that it's just it's almost difficult to wrap your head around how much uh, Russia has, has suffered from a troop perspective. This is what led to the end of the Soviet uh, campaign in Afghanistan going back uh, 30 years from when it ended and 40 years when it started. And it really was that domestic political pressure from families of the fallen that eventually uh, in addition to the losses on the battlefield, sort of woke the Kremlin up to, to ending the campaign, even though they didn't achieve most of their objectives. So I suspect it's going to be that type of domestic political pressure that will change the trajectory of the campaign inside or for, for President Putin and for Russia. You've worked for multiple intelligence and security agencies in the United States. Have you seen any intelligence that backs up Vladimir Putin's statement that especially in those eastern Donetsk and Luhansk regions, where there are the majority of Russian speakers living, that those people actually want to be part of the Russian Federation? Because the future of those two particular areas could well be something that lasts for decades and decades after the war has ended. Well, uh, I have been out of the government for, for several years, so I clearly don't have access to, to anything on the, the intelligence side anymore. But e Eastern Ukraine has been considered, from the Russian perspective, sort of territorially part of 
Russia proper and the cultural and historic uh, and familial uh, ties between peoples on, on both sides of the border. So I think President Putin will continue to use that claim that this is special territory for Russia. And again, it shows that he is willing to incur these horrific losses for Russian troops in order to to either annex that land or or carve out some chunk of that tory, territory and and hold it in Russia proper. But the Ukrainians are clearly pushing back on that narrative, both at the political level and then on the battlefield as well. Javed Ali from Ann Arbor. Thank you so much indeed, Javed.